really care much for that style of architecture. You know, with all the, the curves and, and frills. Oh, well, <laughs> I guess it was built in a pretty gaudy period. Still, I'm sorry to tear the old place down. I'm not. When I was a kid, the palace was a concert hall. And when I was a teenager, I used to take dates there for movies. John Wayne. And now you can go there to see Triple X movies. Mm. Yuck. Well, I used to have a souvenir to remember 10 cent matinees on Saturdays. Bogart. Cagney. Oh, Arthur, you're such a romantic. Uh, I have to be going. Bye. Bye. Repetition of designs, like these, was once common in architecture. But today, well, this sort of thing is considered needlessly extravagant. And I guess the same thing has happened in language. Correct style in the 20th century is concise, clear, and uncluttered with flowery repetition of phrases. We remove unnecessary words and phrases. For instance, have a look at this pretentious passage. I guess the writer thought he was words worth a long fellow, but wordy and long-winded is more like it. Do us the courtesy to create a composition on the subject of the institution of business where you currently find employment. I'm using this passage to make a point. First, the phrase do us the courtesy to. How about please? Now, create a composition. How about simply write? And replace on the subject of with about. Finally, the institution of business where you currently find employment, I think your job. Just about says it all. Please write about your job. This chapter is about cutting out useless and unnecessary words and using the right words to say what you mean. First, let's talk about redundancy. Redundant people say the same thing over and over. So don't let your sentences suffer the same shortcoming. Try to recognize these common examples of needless repetition and cut them out of your writing. Accidents that occur. Autobiography of her life. But, nevertheless, incidentally, by the way, drove by car. Repeat again. Requirements needed, tall in height, empty out, inside of. Now, see if you can determine the problem with this sentence. As soon as they arrived, they were ready to return back home. Return means go back. You don't need both words meaning the same thing. As soon as they arrived, they were ready to return home. Oh, Sonia, have you finished that letter to Acme Demolition? If one more customer complained of falling debris outside our Lexington Avenue entrance... Sincerely, Virginia Johnson, Supervisor, Customer Service. There, I'll print it and you can sign it. Wait, let me have a look while it's still in the system. Dear sirs, unless you act to protect pedestrians from falling debris, the Lacey's department store will have to persecute. The word you should use, Sonia, is prosecute. To persecute means to abuse or annoy someone. Like, uh, Freddy does to me. Who? Me? <laughs> it's not only our customers' complaints that concern us, but also the principle of the matter. 
You should, of course, provide a protective walkway for the safety of all. Not bad, huh? No, but you've made some common errors. It's easy to confuse words that sound alike. Coarse, spelled C-O-A-R-S-E, means rough. But you mean coarse, C-O-U-R-S-E, like without a doubt. And that's spelled with a U. Right. And you spelled principal, like the principal of a school. Oh, and, and, and I meant like a... A uh... uh, moral value? Yes. How do you know of such things? Oh, coarse one. That's C-O-A-R-S-E. <laughs> you need to spell principal P-L-E. These words are called homonyms. I'm a what? Homonyms. Homonyms are words that sound alike but have different meanings and spellings. Lots of people have trouble with words like course and principle. It's so easy just to use the first spelling that pops into your head without thinking. So study the list of words that sound the same or similar and do the practice sentences in your workbook. Learn to recognize problem words like idle. For instance, do I mean I-D-O-L, someone to worship, or I-D-L-E, like not busy? You often see homonyms in advertising and puns. For instance, the hospital that advertises, we take patients. The meanings are different, but in this case, both work. So's the title of this series. Right, right is a command, but it also refers to the right, the privilege, which you have to write. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Okay, goodbye. Look at this article. They're going to tear down that beautiful old palace theater in spite of all my historical club did to try to save it. You mean that old, moldy, gaudy building on Lexington Avenue? You would know about old and moldy. And you would know about gaudy. Well, anyway, I'm writing a personal letter to the editor to make it perfectly clear how I feel about this matter. Look at this. I read in your paper where they are planning to raise another old landmark building, irregardless of the advice of people everywhere. My historical club knows this building formally contributed to the culture of this town. If I was in charge of this city, I would not allow this to proceed. So you think this is perfectly clear. It is the most confusing use of words I have ever seen. Look at this first sentence. I read in your paper where they are planning. It is not where. It is I read in your paper that they are planning to. Do you mean to lift the building? Of course not. You know, tear down a building. Then you spell that word R-A-Z-E. Raise another old landmark building. There is no such word as irregardless. But I hear people use it all the time. Unfortunately, so do I. But it is always incorrect. The proper word is regardless. Regardless of the... Now, do you mean opinion here? Yes, people's opinion. Well, the word that means opinion or information is spelled with a C. A-D-V-I-C-E. Regardless of the advice of people everywhere, there is never an S on everywhere or anywhere or somewhere. Now, that sentence is right. Let's continue correcting your confusion. My historical club knows this building. Now, here, do you mean at a previous time contributed to the culture? Yes, of course I do. What's the matter? Then you mean formerly, 
F-O-R-M-E-R-L-Y. My historical club knows the building formerly contributed to the culture of this town. That sentence is okay. Now let's go on. You're not in charge of this town. You know I'm not. Thank goodness. <laughs> and heaven forbid you should ever be in charge. So you're writing about something that is not true and contrary to fact. And when you state something in this manner that is contrary to fact, you use the verb were. You use the verb were with subjects like I, he, she, it. You should say, if I were in charge of this city, I would not allow this to... Do you mean to go before? I mean, I would not allow this to continue. In that case, the word should be proceed, which means to continue. And speaking of proceeding or continuing, I would like to be able to proceed with my work. Well, by all means, continue with your work while I proceed with my letter. Along with these words that sound the same, you should also study other commonly confused words. They're so similar that people often use the wrong one. For instance, avocation and vocation have very different meanings. Arthur's vocation is writing, but his avocation is carpentry. Your vocation is your career, but your avocation is a hobby. And there's immigrant and emigrant. Only a slight difference in pronunciation, but clearly distinct in meaning. For instance, Sonia, an emigrant from Europe, is an immigrant living in the United States. I remember these two by their first letters. E, like exit, for the country the emigrant exited. I, like in in, for the country the immigrant is living in. If you find you really have trouble recognizing the right word in these pairs, take extra time to study spellings and definitions. But let's try a few right here. If we adopt or adapt a daughter, she will have to adapt or adopt to our ways. Okay, in the first sentence, we're using adopt to mean take on. That's spelled with an O. But in the second case, adapt is used to mean adjust. That's spelled with an A. If we adopt a daughter, she will have to adapt to our ways. Let's try another. She bought herself some personalized stationery with an A or stationery with an E. Spelled with an A, stationary means still or not in motion. But spelled with an E, it means writing paper. Let's try one more. After a walk in the desert, all we could think of was a cold dessert. Here, dessert with a double S refers to the sweet stuff. Sometimes I like to make up little associations, like I think of the double S in dessert as a double scoop of ice cream. Double whammy. One foot broke the windshield of my car. The other foot broke my brand new racing mirror. 
Someone's been kicking your car? No. Pieces off those ugly little trolls on the roof of the Palace Theater. Gargoyle. Well, whatever. <sighs> Mrs. Johnson, would you help me with this insurance claim? Sure. It says, describe the incident which resulted in the loss or damage to your property. Well, what have you written so far? <clears throat> My car was damaged by a piece of concrete which fell down when the Acme Demolition Company knocked it down from the building. You could make that sentence more forceful. Look. The Acme Demolition Company knocked concrete loose which fell and damaged my car. So it would be more forceful to say, it hit me, rather than I was hit by it. Right, it's much less passive. <laughs> you call these passive? <laughs> the active voice, as opposed to the passive voice, gives the sentence strength and force. I'll show you what I mean. This book was written by me. Is a weak sentence. But when I write, I wrote this book, you have the subject of the sentence clearly performing the action. Or these sentences. My claim was settled by the insurance company. The insurance company settled my claim. Do you see that the second sentence is less wordy and much more straightforward and direct? Let's see if we can't improve on a few weak, passive sentences. The chicken was barbecued by my brother, Tom. How would you strengthen it? Right. My brother, Tom, barbecued the chicken. If a sentence starts out with the active voice, it should continue in that voice. Look at this sentence. My brother Tom barbecued the chicken and the dessert was prepared by my sister-in-law. To maintain consistency, we should write, my brother Tom barbecued the chicken and my sister-in-law prepared the dessert. And there are other ways to strengthen the impact of your sentences. For one thing, you should avoid the indefinite use of pronouns like it, you, and they. I'll show you what I mean. In one biography of Mark Twain, it tells of his notorious bad temper and use of swear words. You can get rid of two unnecessary words, in and it, by writing. One biography of Mark Twain tells of his notorious bad temper and use of swear words. Now, how might you rewrite this sentence? In the local record store, they have a rule against you returning opened albums. Write, take out the words in, they, and you. The local record store has a rule against returning opened albums. Again, it's a process of cutting out unnecessary words to strengthen the message of your sentence. You should also avoid pronouns that don't clearly relate to anything in the sentence. Jim had a bruise in his toe, and by Tuesday, it was completely gone. What was completely gone? Jim's bruise or his toe? See what I mean? You have to clarify the meaning. Jim had a bruise on his toe, and by Tuesday, the bruise was completely gone. Or better yet, by Tuesday, the bruise on Jim's toe was completely gone. Now, what's necessary to clarify the meaning of this next sentence? The natives told the explorers of cities paved with gold, but they didn't believe their stories. Obviously, they refers to explorers. But the sentence is confusing. Try rewriting the sentence like this. 
The natives told the explorers of cities paved with gold, but the explorers didn't believe their stories. Along with indefinite words like it, you, and they, words like at, which, and that can often be trimmed from your sentences. For instance, where did I see you at? It should be just, where did I see you? So, how's that insurance claim coming? Is it strong, direct, and forceful? Ah, uh, ha, ha, ha. Just listen to this. <clears throat> As I departed employment at Lacey's establishment to wend my way homeward, I witnessed my automobile being struck by a piece of falling gargoyle, which had been dislodged from atop of the palace by Acme Demolition's wrecking tool. You've got to be kidding. Oh, it sounds like insurance language. <laughs> well, what were you trying to say? that on my way home from work, I saw the Acme Destruction Company knock a piece of debris onto my car with a wrecking ball. Then why didn't you write that? Effective writing uses direct, straightforward language. Some writing tries so hard to be good that it turns out very, very bad. Like gaudy architecture, such writing is destined for demolition. Usually, you can make the point with one vivid adjective or adverb. As Mark Twain once said, as to the adjective, when in doubt, strike it out. Writing is one game where the more strikes you make, the better off you are. Think about what can be done for this sentence. A battered, broken down old airplane proceeded slowly down the bumpy, uneven runway and came to a shaky, sputtery, uncertain stop in front of a rotting, junky old hangar. Of course, it's up to the individual writer how this might be reworked. There's no single answer, but the piles of description can be reduced. We might, for instance, write an old airplane bumped down the crumbling runway and sputtered to a stop in front of a dilapidated hangar. Always remember to streamline Remove all unnecessary descriptions. Arthur, well, we finally got the letter sent off to the Acme demolition. Uh-huh, and no more falling debris, right? I told you about the power of strong writing. Well, actually, they finished wrecking the place yesterday. And I don't think that letter would have done much good. Do you know what's going up on that site? Uh-uh. A new Lacey's annex. Thrilling. Mm-hmm. Our management... Hired Acme Demolition. Why couldn't it just turn to... Local funding for GE...